to the Family Movie Night Podcast, episode 35, where we want to help your family have better conversations around the content you consume. My name is Nathan, and uh, I am joined, as always, uh, by the hero of our podcast, Donnie Dorsey, the mom of our podcast, Heidi Cooper, and, of course, the heartless villain of our podcast, Sawyer Hewlett. Uh, today we are discussing uh, a pretty wonderful film that I think because we're getting close to it being 20 years old, a lot of families maybe have watched together. It's 2003's Freaky Friday, available on Disney+. Plus. If you don't know what it's about, uh, it is a remake uh, of the earlier Disney film uh, where a single mother, Tess Coleman, who is played by Jamie Lee Curtis, and her teenage daughter, Anna, played by Lindsay Lohan, uh, they could not be more different, and it is driving them both insane. After receiving cryptic fortune cookies at a Chinese restaurant, the two wake up the next day to discover they have somehow switched bodies. And unable to switch back, they are forced to masquerade as one another until a solution can be found. In the process, they develop a new sense of respect and understanding for one another. It's funny. It's heartwarming. Uh, and we're going to get to all that in a minute. But first, Donnie Dorsey, tell them what we do on this podcast. Yeah, so on this podcast, we encourage every family at Community Christian Church to have a monthly movie night to help you and your children build memories and start conversations that matter. The goal of our family ministry is to help you raise your children to love Jesus and his way of life above all other things. And we know that critical to that is for you to have a routine, regular time of connection and shared experiences that will help you build stronger relationships. And movie nights are great opportunities to do that because, you know, movies are not, they're not just an easy way to share laughter and joy, you know, fear and sadness in this safe environment. But, you know, they also give us a chance to talk about what matters to us in ways that are meaningful and memorable with our children. And, uh, you know, on this podcast, we, we want to not only recommend some movies you could watch on your, your movie nights, but, uh, but give you ideas of meaningful conversations you can have with your children uh, during or, or even after the movie. And as always, the point of this podcast is not to add one more thing to your to-do list as parents that you're going to feel guilty about later for not doing. We want to make it easier for you and your kids to enjoy being together so that you can build memories and have conversations that matter. So throughout our conversation today, remember that we just want you guys to have fun and to help you think of simple and easy ways to share your love of Jesus with your kids. And uh, we think this movie is going to give you a great opportunity to do that, in particularly uh, because of the fact uh, of what the movie is about. Um, and we'll get to the themes in a moment, but really this idea of being able to talk with your kids about how to build strong relationships uh, as uh, children are becoming more independent and they're becoming teenagers and they're having their own thoughts and their own ideas. And you as a parent feel like you're drifting apart. How does this movie show us a way uh, that really, we believe, honors uh, the Jesus way of building relationships and strengthening relationships with your kids? But before we get to that really heartfelt part, let's just talk about why this movie works. I mean, this movie is almost 20 years old, uh, very much feels of the early 2000s. Um, I mean, strong on those vibes. Are young kids or teenagers going to enjoy watching this movie? Uh, Donnie, why don't you start us off? What, what do you think works about this movie for uh, people who have teenagers, young kids in the house? What, what, what do you think? So I think um, from a like from a teenager standpoint, I think uh, teenagers can enjoy this movie because I think in certain ways, depending on where they are in their relationship with their parents, they may have a little bit of relatability to it where they're having the conversations of, well, mom doesn't understand me or dad doesn't understand me. And the parents feeling like, I don't understand you. Like, so there's definitely a good, like there's a lot of heart that runs through this movie that makes it feel relatable. It makes it feel very comfortable to be uncomfortable. Yeah. If that makes any sense. So, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a good watch. When there's a lot of uh, comfortable to be uncomfortable moments, I'll just say the best one is when they have switched bodies and they're getting dressed in the morning and the young man accidentally, uh, the, the young brother uh, ends up accidentally seeing his uh, mother's underwear as she walks <laughs> into the room. Uh, one of the greatest uh, gross out faces from a child that is the most <laughs> relatable feeling in the world. Uh, so 
Yeah, uh, this movie I think is a really funny. Um, and and you know, humor often doesn't translate over generations, but this movie is really um still very funny and mm -hmm. very uh I think because of maybe the timeless elements of teenager teenage girls and their moms and the kind of relationships that you know and the problems we know come with that. But um, I think what makes this movie work as well as it does is both uh, Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan. Absolutely. I think their performances, and obviously Jamie Lee Curtis is one of the um, best performances in the film just in her, um, in, in the way that she portrays both a kind of critical mother, but also this uh, teenage girl in an older woman's body, all that kind of stuff. But I think Lindsay Lohan is doing just as good of a job as playing an older woman stuck in a in a, a young woman's body. Sawyer, you're nodding. Is that what you think works best about this movie? Yeah, this is this is easily my favorite aspect of the movie is the humor aspect, and and specifically in that relationship, I I think and like and this is like my thing with like the relatability aspect is like I don't know which age groups of kids will like this movie today. Um, this is I, I feel like this is a difficult movie to gauge on like who who I can guess will really like it just because honestly it's a really weird premise for a movie um and I I really like that you you hit the nail on the head Jamie Lee Curtis I I think I don't know if it's just because I feel like they give her more really funny stuff to do I feel like Jamie Lee Curtis like backpacks this movie when it comes to the humor side and i do think Lindsay lohan does a really good job especially like playing off of that like she's kind of reacting to a lot of that stuff and she does a great job with that um i i just i i i i noticed like i was surprised at how much i was chuckling throughout this yeah. movie um oh, dude the the whole romantic arc that gets established. Oh yeah, with so Ch Chad weird. Michael Murray. <laughs> it's so weird and funny. Oh um, well, but you know, I think it works. I think we have. It such, does. I mean, because I'll say this. So when you say what kind of kid, all of my kids have watched this movie. I think now three times. It's one of their favorite movies. Yeah. They, and my kids are about to be six, seven, eight, and ten, and they all of them for different reasons. My ten-year-old, who's kind of at that preteen, you know, she likes the idea of like, oh, I get to see what high school's like, and you know, you're kind of like looking forward to what that kind of thing is like when you're in high school and you're watching all those like college like frat party movies, you know, because you're like, yeah. what is it like to be in high school and you're seeing all that, and she kind of understands that. But also, my little kids just think it's funny to watch a teenager acting like an adult or an adult act like watching Jamie Lee Curtis like punch the little kid and pick on the little brother you know there's yeah. something that's just inherently really funny about that or you yeah. say donnie yeah i mean i think the chemistry on screen like it it definitely contributes to everything about it because every i you get lost in the characters like for a moment because like i said like like you were saying earlier like jamie lee curtis like when she's in the role of being the mom, she is fantastic. And when she's in the role of playing as the kid and teenager, yeah, she does it fantastically too with like physical comedy and like it's just it's, well, it's and, really and we really as as a as a as a movie going uh audience, but also Hollywood in general, we just have not treasured Jamie Lee Curtis like we should have. Yeah. Uh she you don't see her. I mean, she just she's just fantastic. Uh this year she was in everything everywhere all at once and is one of the best parts of that movie. Just absolutely able to be hilarious, but also be incredibly heartwarming, like just make you care about a character that you should have no reason to care about. And this movie's the same way. Heidi, I want to throw it to you. Uh you are a mom. You are the mom of the podcast. Was this movie relatable to you as a mom? Oh, definitely. Definitely, for sure. Um, I think it was relatable to me as a mom with my teenager, but also um, thinking back about, because when I was watching this movie for the first time, I was a teenager with a mom. Right, right. <laughs> that I saw with constantly so yeah it was very relatable and uh jamie lee curtis i i just want to add my two thoughts she definitely is um like so perfect at this role her facial yeah. expressions just that in and of itself like yes. if you could just take all her facial expressions they would be the best memes <laughs> <laughs> well, and she just sells out to it. You know, this is not a very glamorous role in right. that she really has to play up 
uh, being old and and feeling unattractive and feeling and so like it's not very glamorous, but she plays. When the daughter the, says she's a crypt keeper, yeah, <laughs> looking yeah, at her I'm body, the I'm the crypt keeper. <laughs> Yes, yes. All the, I think all of that, that she just plays it so well, but she plays it with such a confidence. And it just, I mean, it really is just fun to watch. And I think as a family, there were so many moments watching this with my kids that give you those moments as a parent where you're like, oh, oh, that's you. That's you. That's what you do. Or, oh, that's what you do. And I think those moments really as a family and the same thing, they would do the same thing. Oh, my. Oh, that's exactly how a mom acts. Oh, that's exactly how a dad is. You know what I mean? Like, those moments, just as a family, just on a pure enjoyment level, is something, and I'm a huge like Marvel nerd super fan, you don't get in those kind of movies. You don't get in a movie that's just about we got to go save the world or everything's falling apart or even, you know, even a lot of Pixar things that are kid related. This is just such a, it, I know it's obviously a supernatural element, but it's such a real world setting with real world stakes of there's this wedding that the mom really wants to have happen. Right. And she's, but the the daughter doesn't care about it. And the daughter's got this band and these dreams and these goals and the mom doesn't care about it. And that is just so relatable. I think uh, the, the, even the, the test taking, you know, she, the mom right. has a certain client and the daughter's like, this is ridiculous. Like, right. Surely that can't be that big of a deal or that stressful to handle. And then the, daughter has the test that she has to take and the mom is like wait what like as she's just reading yeah. the problem she's confused yes that every parent who's me. told their kid school is not that hard and then you have to look at their homework and you're like what How? <laughs> what is this <laughs> this is what math is you know it's like <laughs> what is going on so 100 percent. so we're all we're all saying this is a great movie i will say it's pg for people who are looking for uh, towards it, even though it's really set in high school, there's nothing really that objectionable going on. Uh, it's a very lighthearted movie. Uh, lots of fun. As I already mentioned, I think the music's pretty great as someone who grew up in learning to play music in the 2000s pop punk scene. This is a pretty decent little uh, pop punk music that's getting played. So uh, I think uh, I think you will have a lot of fun with it. But we also think there are great conversations you could have around this movie and it really centers around that idea of what how do you hold uh your relationship with your kid when they have become a young adult when they're a teenager when they're growing and they have their own ideas and, and the way we kind of said it to one another is when you when your kid has reached a stage of life that you don't even recognize them some days you go what happened to my sweet little six-year-old that wanted to tell me about every scrape and bruise and every petal on every flower they found? And now they don't want to speak to me and they just come in and they slam the door. And I know there's problems going on in their life, but they won't talk to me about it or whatever the different thing is. As your kid grows, how do we not grow apart? Right? As your kid grows, how do we not grow apart? And, and, uh, this movie really addresses a lot of that. Um, and it really comes to the central conceit of the movie, which is uh, trying to see things from another person's point of view, right? This this mom and this daughter really have terrible communication. I mean, that's just, they have really a lack of communication. They don't really speak, they speak at one another, but they don't really speak to one another. Um, and they both don't care about the other person's problems. And then they're forced into this situation where, they have to live in another person's shoes. Uh, and I think there's a way to have conversations about that. So, uh, Donnie, why don't you start us off on this idea of how getting perspective from your kid's point of view, specifically once a kid's kind of entering into those preteen, teenager years, how that can change the way you parent uh, in that situation? I mean, I think as like, especially as the kid gets to the age of I won't say of maturity, but as they're maturing and changing and kind of developing their own identity outside of being your kid. I think that conversation is just really just focused on listening and yeah. hearing what your kid is saying, because I think it's, you know, like, cause I grew up in the, like the generation of the idea where, you know, kids are to be present, but silent kind of thing. Like, yeah. Seen, like say, not heard. 
yeah, like say, say less, like, you know, in that moment of like, but I think it does, it, it can do damage. It doesn't always, but it can do damage because it's the idea of, well, as a child, I don't have a voice. So then by the time I get to the point where I'm old enough, now I want to voice every possible opinion I have and everything and everything is very counter and very like just ah freedom kind of thing. And whereas if you're constantly having conversations with your kid, connecting to them in, you know, day to day in the, you know, weekly things, and it's so critical because then you can understand you're not just saying seeing them in the light of what you've seen them as your baby, you know, like when they right. were little and all this stuff, you see them as this soon to be one day an adult that will have their own troubles, their own like situations. And then they will understand, Hey, you've listened to me since I was small and you still listen to me with the same kindness in, in like in how you speak and how you hear me. Yeah. I now want to keep you as part of my life. Whereas some parents get to the point where they're trying so hard to they're squeezing so tight that they lose grip. And, yeah. and instead of like, it's yeah, the idea they squeeze of like, the kid out of their fingers. Exactly. Yeah. Like it's like the opposite, like where, you know, you talk about like with money and things like when it runs through your hands, if you keep your hands open, it's easier for it to flow in and out. Right. But when you're squeezing so tight, it's the same thing with relationships with our kids and just any relationship. When you squeeze so tight to try to maintain control or hold it there, it's either going to lose the like desire to connect at all. Yeah. Or it's going to eventually, once they get the freedom to get away from you, they're not going to look back. Well, and I think, Donnie, a key part of this, and you see this in the movie. So one, we've already seen they don't listen to each other. They're just no. yelling at each other. But they both carry judgments Oh, about yeah. the other person. You don't know what my life's like. Your life's easy. My life, you know, that you couldn't last a day in my shoes. You see that whole thing. And I think that happens a lot. Obviously, kids carry judgment, especially when they're teenagers. They have judgments about their parents' life with absolutely no experience to back it up, right? Like, you know, yep. your life's not that hard. I could go to work and do this. And then you're like, okay, well, obviously, you, you don't know. Which, I'll say this. As the parent, you know they don't know. Yeah. So why are you arguing about that with them? Like, you know, they don't know. They don't know. They don't know what life is like. Why are you having that argument? But you also, and I think this happens, you have lots of experience with your kid, but yeah. your kid is changing and you carry, I know I do, a lot of judgments about my own kid based on how I knew them at five. Yeah. And what I knew about them at six and what I knew about them at seven. And sometimes it's hard for us to let our children grow and change into who they God is making them to be, who they're changing into be. Uh, and Or maybe they're not allowing God to change them and they're becoming a different kind of person. And that scares you, too. Yeah. But you carry these judgments uh, and that keeps you from listening. Uh and I think we see that in this movie. Uh, Heidi, I saw you nodding your head. Uh, do you have anything to add on that? I know you've had a child who has grown and is now out of the house. Uh, does Is that a relatable thing of I kind of carry around these judgments and these ideas and it keeps me from seeing who they really are? Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's so easy for us to look back at ourselves in our 20s and think, oh, I've changed so much. And right. we don't want people to judge us based on who we were at 22 years old. Right. But we look at our kids and we think, you know, yeah, you know, like my my um <clears throat> my oldest is he's always been a really outgoing kid and you know, never like the need to be at the center of attention, but he was he could be comfortable in any room. Um right. or, or at least appear that way and as he got older, he um didn't want to be as social and you know, be in a, in social settings as much. And I was concerned about something that was not necessarily something I needed to be concerned about. He just um, had really come into his own and was like, yeah, I realized that I love being around people, but I have to have a lot. I have a, have a significant amount of time where I am by myself or just with a, you know, one or two other people to really be well and to m maintain myself. Yeah. So I think that it's just uh, it's an exciting journey we get to go on with our kids, but they're changing constantly. And we um, should I, I know I've said this before on here, but like 
my goal now as a mom um, is to observe as much as I'm trying to steer or direct, you yeah. know? Yeah. Well, and I, I've heard someone say before, and I think it's true that the uh, really your job, when your kids are really young, it's different. Like you do have to have lots of authority and control and all of that because they're tiny. And I don't, I don't need to just observe, well, they're about to walk off that cliff. Let me, what, what should I do about it? like <laughs> they're when they're little, like when they're really little, there's lots of control and lots of boundaries and rules and that let me teach you just how to interact but as they grow especially into those preteen teen young adult years you want to become and i've heard someone say that being a parent is really becoming a student of your children like yeah. you said observing listening dropping those judgments trying to figure out who they are so that you can help them learn how to navigate life based on the unique way god has made them because you do have that experience they don't have and you see that in this movie where the mom is constantly like, why aren't you friends with that girl? Y'all were best friends and y'all had sleepovers. Well, it turns out that girl has become someone no one wants to be around, right? Like there's yeah. something that's done that. Or oh, it's like, why are you dressing this way and putting, you know, the black fingernails and this whole thing? You used to be X, Y, and Z. And, you know, you used to talk to me and it's, well, she's become her own person and she has her own ideas and the mom's unable. And what I think is funny is the mom is a psychologist. Like the mom knows how to listen to her clients. She even tells her at one point what you should say to your client when you have to pretend to be me is, and how does that make you feel? And the mom doesn't understand how to apply that in her relationship. In fact, she's trying to, at one point, the, the daughter says like, don't shrink me, mom. Like I can tell you're using your professional therapist thing. I want you just to yeah. listen to me. Yeah. So uh, there's this one scene and it's when, they are about to switch. Um, and, and she says, the daughter says something. And then she says back to her, the mom says back to her. So what I'm hearing is, and then she says like a totally different thing than what she, <laughs> so right. she, what she took it to mean is what she says back. And uh, I just, I had to laugh because I'm like that we do that as parents where we're like, okay, well, I, I know I am the only one who actually knows how to have this conversation the right way yes. and what we're, you know, like yeah. what's real, what's not. And, and then she, you know, she's using her psycho, you know, psychological tools that she's yeah. learned <laughs> to uh, manipulate her daughter. And yeah, that obviously doesn't go well and they switch places. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking when, when you were talking about, and cause this is my brain, my brain like converts stuff into quotes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about it and I was like, it's the idea is like, we should, like collect memories, not live in them. Right. And it's that, and I think as parents, we do more staying in the memory of, oh, you were so cute and you did these things as opposed to going, wow, that was a great moment. I can't wait to see what comes next. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. And I think, so here's how I would have this conversation. This has been more parent centric than how you have the conversation with your kid. But I think the conversation, I said this to my daughters at one point is, you know, we, we're not going to be able to switch bodies and you're not going to be able to see things from my point of view. I'm not going to be able to see things from your point of view. But if we always talk to one another yeah. and we're honest with one another and we listen to one another, we can we can learn from each other. Sawyer, I know you have a, um, a, a good relationship with your parents. And I know you've talked before on the podcast about how you felt like your parents did a lot of this. Obviously, not everything perfect, but you felt like they they did a good job as you were kind of entering in those teenage years. How did you see your parents kind of navigate this whole watching you grow and change and being able to listen and not judge and all of that? Um, th this is This might be difficult to hear. They allowed me to fail and then were supportive through that failure yeah that's the biggest thing that i think any parent can be especially when you're dealing with a teenager because they're they're gonna fail for me when i was in like high school especially it was socially to a certain extent i didn't yeah. have a ton of friends um and i thought because when i like growing up like i did have a lot of friends and i, I similar to to your son heidi i i became a lot more introverted uh, as I got older and I actually, or what, you know, as junior hires do, I was dramatically ashamed of that. I, I did not like that. I would prefer spending time with just maybe a couple of friends and just like watching movies and playing video games. I didn't like that about myself. Um, 
And I didn't like that I preferred swimming and track to to basketball or baseball because those were more sociable stuff. Um, and my parents did a great job of a telling me that's not a bad thing. But even like when I was like on a on a roll of just like making bad decisions because of that they never like bullied me or uh, bullied not the right word they never tried to like force me into doing yeah. like the you right put thing. that parental pressure nagging mm-hmm. guilt yeah. trips all the kind yeah, of- yeah they kind of allowed you to like with and that's a, that's a huge part of parenting is like yeah. allowing kids to make mistakes within like a very you know safe based on their age limited environment i think that's so huge and then like if you don't then you get to where you're like me and your kid is you know 13 14 15 that age where they're right about to the age where they can make these like life-altering major decisions um and you're you know kind of trying to like catch up and navigate like oh what does this look like for them to you know fail a class because they um you know, as much as you try, like you don't, you don't run out to get the supplies the night before when they're in seventh grade, because they're not in fourth grade anymore. (laughs) They don't need you to do this for them. This is not helping them. It's better. They fail this class in seventh grade than their whole, you know, first year of college. Yeah. 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 And like, I think that like this movie in particular, I feel like, especially like the mom character, I feel like at the beginning of the movie, she thinks she has a lot of control and everything is kind of just going well. She thinks that everything is perfect. And the like her and her daughter are just not on the same page about, about their lives. And I, I, I think the movie, A, with humor and also with good storytelling, does a great job of illustrating her figuring out, oh, things are not as perfect with my right. daughter and with my life. And I, it's a little bit of the, uh, the curtain coming back. And Lindsay Lohan does play a great does play that well and i think i think that part that is clear in the movie is and this kind of brings everything we've been saying together here is the mom assumes she knows why Lindsay lohan the daughter doesn't isn't excited about the marriage like and Mm -hmm. she assumes it's a you don't like him or i know it's something to do with your dad yeah her dad had passed away and i know it's something and she's like talk to me talk to me and her way to get you to talk is i'll just keep badgering you to talk to me let me just badger you i mean which is such a and i don't want to just say mom i'm a dad that's my technique like just speak to me no you can't leave this room till we speak and like if you have a kid who's very stubborn and strong-willed they'll just sit there and stare at you because it's fun to make dad look like an idiot you know i thought or if you have a kid who's an internal processor oh yeah because that's what i had he was he's his temperament is very laid back. He processes it internally. And then most things he's going to work their work itself out in his processing. Right. Yeah. But yeah. And when I would try to force conversations, ooh, that didn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> well I, was you thinking, say, Donnie? I was thinking about the fact that I don't know if they did this on purpose um, or if it was just something that, you know, overanalyzing it or whatever, but like when she removed the door, it's almost the same way as what she was badgering. She was like, Yes, can right. you just remove this barrier so I can talk to you? I don't understand. Please, like she, like it's like metaphorically removing that door, saying, "Look, please, I just want to understand. I want to see you for who you are." And she was like, "Nope, gonna close that out." You well, know, and I even think. think the door thing felt to me like a less influence, more control. It's the way yeah. that you would yeah. do a a a four year old who slammed their door. Yeah, uh, and I think she eventually sees like that's not the approach I can take with my teenager. Uh, And so all that to say, I think this movie gets you to that. There's a couple other things we want to talk about before we run out of time. One of those is we talked a lot about uh, before we were filming the stepdad character who really kind of uh, exemplifies the way that really Jamie Lee Curtis should have been approaching the relationship anyway, where he has this moment where when they're still switched and it's actually the teenager in Jamie Lee Curtis's body, she says something like to him, I know you don't care about her band or her music. And he just like shuts down. He's like, we can't be married if that's what you think this is going to be. And he's like, because I have never tried to force my relationship on the teenage daughter. I have, I have always wanted her to come to me on her own terms. I knew we, I needed to earn the relationship with her. And what we said is 
that's so important. And it's, I think it's even more difficult when you're not the stepdad coming into the relationship and it's clear you have no relationship. It's hard when I'm mom or dad and I've had you since birth and now you're 13 and you're a completely different kid. And I want to use all the lever of uh, relational leverage I've built up over 13 years and you don't care at all. And so you have, you have parents saying, I have fed you. I changed your diapers. I did this. And the 13 year old's like, you don't get credit for doing things that you would have gone to jail for not doing <laughs> like any parents. Like I fed you and I didn't let you die. And it's like, yeah, cause you would have gone to jail had you done that. So like, you don't get credit when you pull into a parking spot and you didn't run over 10 people. Like <laughs> I, someone give me a medal, you know? Uh, I, the, uh, I, I feel yeah. like the the stepdad, the Mark Harmon character, I can't remember his name. We're all just calling him the stepdad at this uh, point. Uh, Ryan. Ryan. Okay, yeah. I'm going to remember that. Yeah, well, that, that's <laughs> everyone's name. Jake, yeah. Maddie. Yeah. Like, uh, um, but no, I I feel like the, the movie does a great job of kind of also making him like the audience surrogate of just like, what is going on here? Like, yeah. I'm trying to be a normal human being. These two crazy people are just like destroying this world. It's it is I really like that aspect while we're while we're on the stepdad matter. But I think I think there's a way. So can we talk about how the movie really sets up how this kind of gentle I want to influence without trying to control my teenager? Uh how does how does that show us a different a different aspect of how we do this? Man, I think it's it's the approach we should take but we often don't take because we've been i guess almost it's been viewed as control is the way to make things happen the way you want them yeah but often it's not about wanting to do things the way you want them it's about being present yeah and to be in control means you're not really present cuz you're trying to focus on trying to avoid some yeah, situation you know, but if we're if we're able to go, you know what, I'm going to focus on the influence. Like, it's like the thing. I'm glad that I had people around me that have like been there to help with influence because in understanding that at some point you lose control of the situation. Like as your kids get older, like, yeah, you they they respect you to a certain extent. But then as they get older. They're not looking for you to tell them what to do. They are looking for you to walk alongside them. And well, yeah, it's when I was I was talking to a guy who's got a 17 year old who wants to get a tattoo. Uh, and he's like, I, I can't stand that. I'm going to tell him absolutely not. We're going to have this whole thing. And he said, but I'm terrified when he's 18, he's going to get the tattoo anyway. And I said, yeah. he probably will. And I'm not saying you let your 17 year old get the tattoo. But if you make this a knockdown drag out fight at 17, they're yeah. still going to get the tattoo at 18 and they may no longer speak to you anymore. Yeah. And you, you not only have lost control, you've lost the relationship. And I think we all have those kind of, you know what I mean? We all have those kind of things in yeah. our, in our, and, and I think that's why it's hard to not reach for control because the problems at 17 are a lot scarier than they are Yeah, at seven. Yeah, I think yeah. the anxiety of a I think the anxiety of being a parent is watching them get older because now the world is has become bigger. Yes. Like because you know, when they're younger, the world is smaller because yeah. they're only they can only be within your purview of what you give them to entertain or bring into their worldview. Yeah. But as they get older, they have to expand that. And you yes. get afraid of, well, I can't stop you know, this neighbor, or I can't stop this city, I can't stop this state and all these things that are happening around me. And so the idea is that I can stop them. Or you not, think you can. Exactly. Like, yeah. But in reality, you're not stopping them. What you're doing is you're putting a, a, a hard stop on your relationship. Well, you're trying to put barriers up between them and the thing you don't want them to do, yeah. but you're putting barriers up between you and them. And yeah. I think I think so. Like the way I see it is, and I, I've, I've, I've heard this is this is not my wisdom from my experience. It's wisdom I have heard uh, and am trying to apply. Is that when your children are young, control is necessary. Mm -hmm. When your children get older, influence is what you want. And what I often see happen with people in my stage of parenting, keep 
where you should have lots of control, four and five year olds, you know, and you're trying to teach them, hey, nope, we don't talk like that. Nope, mm, we don't do that. Nope, mm, mm, you can't go over there. Nope, you can't do this. There are a lot of parents who, because they don't want, because you have to do that a lot when yeah. they're five. We want, we want to influence more. Now, do we think it's a good idea to tell them to shut up? Do we think saying shut up's a good thing to say? Instead of, no, we don't say that. But then they go to a 17-year-old who says a word they don't like, goes, uh uh-uh. We don't do that. And I'm going, you're speaking to a 17 year old (laughs) like you should be speaking to your and you're speaking to your five year old like you should be speaking to the 17 year old. And we get it backwards. And I think the reason why is we know a five year old saying shut up is not a big deal. And so we try to treat this with this very gentle, influential approach. And then when they're 17, I'm really freaked out that you're going to say a bad thing to somebody who's your boss. And so I'm going to yell at you and try and have the control and try and put all these boundaries around you. And both approaches are not helpful because it is true. The proverb from the Bible, of you train up a child in the way they should go and they won't depart from it. Now, that doesn't that's not a promise. That doesn't mean if you do everything exactly right, your kid turns out exactly right. But it does mean and this is the truth. You our lives are trajectories. Early adjustments really determine the direction that our lives go. And everyone can see this. If I choose every day to be an unloving person, it is much harder when I'm 80 to be kind and loving. If every day I choose to be selfish from the time I'm five years old and I always have to get things my way and I always have to do things my way, it is hard to be selfless when I'm 70 because I have set up the trajectory of my life to go this way. And so when a child is five, to set up their trajectory, say, I'm going to do everything I can to set up your trajectory this way. But Now that you're 17, I can't put my hands on the wheel as much. And I want to have more influence and I want to listen. And we were talking that the stepdad really exhibits that kind of parenting well. I know, Heidi, you mentioned that. Yeah, Nathan, I just kind of wanted to piggyback, like you brought the conversation back around, but I wanted to piggyback back on uh, what Donnie said about being present. I think that um, one thing that like, I've learned like a really practical way to do that in the moment because I went through experience where I was very triggered. And so it was like the, um, it was so easy to see how my mom and I would just go back and forth constantly, you know, when I was a teenager during this stage with my son. And it was because we were so different, but I thought I saw what he saw, you know, and he thought he understood things that I understood. And so in those moments, like one thing that I found was really clutch for me was to pause, like be, be very um, <clears throat> generous with my pauses and ask questions. And I think yeah. that like, you know, we talk about the bigger picture of why we want to do this right with our kids. But I think I want to take it a step further and just give like some personal, you know, uh, things that have helped me, not that I learned on my own, but people help me see to take that pause. When I hear something that feels really scary or really triggering or really disrespectful or something like that, to just pause, <laughs> ask a question, Hey, is that what you meant to say? Cause this is what, you know, not in the way that the mom did it, you know, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, really trying to have that conversation and be open to what your kid is saying um, instead of seeing them, your child as a threat, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think ultimately where we have to get is where the movie, which I thought was a really uh, the way that they're able to switch back is when they do something selfless and self-sacrificial for the other person, which really comes from, you know, Philippians two of looking to the interest of one another, that we're to have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who. Uh, in humility, look to the interest of others, valued the interest of the other over themselves. And I think what, as a parent, to be able to model for our children, I am interested in your good over my own, no matter what uh, part of parenting you're in. Because I think one of the reasons it's really hard, and I'm just because I'm in it, to be the parent who's always, this is the rule when they're four years old. The reason it's hard is because I really want them to like me. I really want them to like being around me. And I really want this. And that's not me looking out for their interest of what this is going to mean when they're 18. That's me looking out for my interest right now of what I want. I want a kid who comes up and goes, mommy, you're the best. Daddy, you're the best. And I'm afraid if I sit, if I, if I, if I lay down the law and give a consequence, they won't ever feel that way about me, which every parent who's ever knows, they immediately feel that way. I mean, if they take five to 10 minutes, but when they're four, it flips around really quick. 
But the same is true when they're 17. And I have a way I wanted your life to turn out. And I have a way I wanted our relationship to turn out. And so I, I want to control and make it happen to say, hey, I'm looking out for your interests. I want to learn who you are. I want to listen. I don't want to hold judgments. And I want to do what's best for you. And that's what love is. Love is doing what is best for somebody, not what they want to happen and not what you want to happen. What is best for them, what God says is best. And God says us choosing to love people, to be gentle, to be humble, even if it means that in their free will, they choose to make bad decisions, that I would still love you and not try to control you because you cannot love and control. It's difficult, but I think this movie gives us a great chance to have that conversation. So let's wrap it up there. Thank you guys for joining in with us this week as you continue to learn, as we're all trying to learn how to have better conversations that lead our children towards loving Jesus and his way of life even more. We'll see you next time.